elaborate. Yeah, yeah, that is a very, very interesting point, uh, which interests me greatly, is the number of primitive societies, talk about primitive societies now, up and down the American coast, uh, in various other parts of the world, and certainly in Papua New Guinea, which was distinctly matriarchal. Distinctly matriarchal. And was so much so that when we, the lords of the manor, the white ladies, took over, we actually forbade the women to be liberalised. That's a leader. A liber uh, is a leader. Uh, they were not allowed. The, the leader was given a red cap, but no woman was given a red cap. And now, the, uh, the funny joke was, it was a joke, the funny joke was that if a, a uh, native person in Papua New Guinea, a native man, wanted a smoko, he had to ask the women for it. But um, the, they don't be really respected it. One uh, running a school, which was mostly adults rather than children, uh, one quote, me about 28 years of age, he said that um, when a woman dies in the tribe this great morning and the man can pass away without hardly recognition. Without what? Hardly recognised. Okay. It, it must be awful. The, most of the tribes, when I first went there, the women were completely in charge. By the time I left, which is 14 years later, it was just the opposite. And that was enforced by legislation. Because the women, uh, when we were having a school meeting, the women would make up their mind, tell the men what to say, and that's how they got their point over. But I thought that was ridiculous. And, but it was encouraged by the authorities, unfortunately. The Australian authorities. Uh, yeah. Uh, but previously, the Germans, see, New Guinea was first uh, popularised by German. It was New Guinea German. And then um, uh, Papua was mainly British all the time, but they had the same, exactly the same thing. They were uh, paternal or, or um, patriarchal. Glenn, um, did um, men and women cohabit after marriage in Papua New Guinea? Not particularly, no. But, but I'm going to qualify it. Every three months, every three months, they had a sing-sing. It was for everybody. And they cohabitated there completely and utterly and foolishly and every other way. But they remained, for, for the main part, separate. Yes. Um, Even after just, marriage? Uh, uh, they only... Uh, uh, did that just during the thing, thing uh, generally her whole weekend. But when they married, when a man married a woman, did they uh, live together now, after nowadays, the marriage? Nowadays they lived together, but that once they didn't. So women had their own land and yeah. own villages? They owned their own trees and all sorts of things. We, we, we took that from them. And um, now then we decided to build habitations for them, and they were all built on family living together. And that created a violence. Rightly or wrongly, it created a violence. They were not a violent people, but they became violent. What about the uh, population size, the fertility? Did that go up with cohabitation? It did, yes. Yeah, badly. Uh, in 14 years did you see that? Yeah, it, it was very, very obvious. It was very, very obvious. There were four regions in Papua New Guinea. One was run by the Catholics. One was run by the Methodist Overseas Mission. 
administered from England. The other one was the German uh, church, and um, oh, Seventh-day Adventist was the other one. By the time I left, there were no less than 34 disparaged religions. I found that although you don't agree with everything in their pagan religion, you don't agree with everything, there was one fundamental rule for all their pagan religions, and that was to keep the village together. I, it was so obvious, and yet the religious people would say, God will forbid this. I thought God would be very pleased about it. <laughs> What do you think of the Australian government um, thinking it can teach Pacific Islanders how to limit their population? Uh, absolutely open. They knew it already. They knew it in full. They knew it in full.